And good afternoon, folks. It's Pierre Escargo, Silver Spoon Coon, George Bartholomew, Coon and Chill Gates. Uh, I'm starting a YouTube channel. Um, it's pretty much going. I'm going to be pretty much doing interviews, uh, going back and forth with other people, artists, comedians, writers, directors, whomever I can get my fucking hands on to come sit down for a few moments, answer a few questions, you know, so forth and so on about what got them started into doing this, and. Uh, I'm trying to keep the uh, channel or the videos, if you will, uh, comedy based at its core, but that doesn't mean, you know, we or I myself and whomever I'm going to be working with on these videos will not, uh, or we're against branching out or talking to whomever, like if you're a painter, photographer, or anything like that. And I plan on using my channel and these videos as a platform to help you advertise, get the word out. Uh, you know, tell your fans, followers, anybody that wants to see your shows or your events, let them know how to find you, where to find you. If you have a social media outlet, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever, I'll have that included in the video as well. So your supporters <coughs> will know when your upcoming shows are going to be. Um, I got this idea from my younger brother. You know, I've been doing comedy, stand-up comedy. I'm a comedian, if you didn't know. I've been doing stand-up comedy for about a year and a half now. And, you know, I was telling him about how it's hard getting in some places, this, that, and the third. By the way, music. Sounds by Coop. Um, but, yeah, I was like, you know, I go to all these comedy clubs. I, sometimes you may not get to perform, but you meet a lot of these different comedians who are also trying to do the same thing that you're doing. And he gave me the idea, was like, well, why don't you, like, kind of open up your own comedy club type deal, or if not that, make yourself a YouTube channel or some type of social media platform where you can talk to these comedians and, you know, you guys can go back and forth, you get the Instagram, you post it on there, so that way they see you posting it, they see that uh, you're doing interviews with some of these people that they see or that they like, You can edit. I'm going to edit the videos, you know, and have it however you want it to be um, I also plan on doing like a podcast type deal because some comedians or some people that I've been speaking to they like the idea of me doing these interviews but they don't want to be on camera they don't uh, feel comfortable being recorded and things like that or they're fine with just their audio but not the visual of them doing it it's a little weird but whatever and you know little brother was just like yeah use this as a way to help you get your name out by getting other people's names out it's like help you help others, but also help yourself at the same time. And this way, when you start doing this, other people will see that you're doing these interviews and making videos for people, like how to find them at this center third, and they'll line up and want to meet you. So that way you can also have a steady income or a steady flow of people or content coming into your videos. And I've been going to a lot of shows and some of the funniest things are, uh, I've heard are actually backstage or in the green rooms because I've met some of the funniest people and then they'll go on stage and just shit the fucking bed. And I'm not gonna say I haven't bombed, because I have. Because, you know, shit just happens, but still, they're still funny people, and you know, they're still always out trying to do their thing, and it ain't no problem for you to try to help somebody else out. So, um, you know, I've asked a few of the homies, you know, to come out and do an interview with me and sit down and ask a few questions and stuff like that. And most comedians have kids or they're on drugs or, you know, they got jobs or probably all of them, you know, and I went to a star bar last night, you know, and just started telling a couple of comedians about what I wanted to do. And a lot of them, like most of them love the idea. Nobody was like, that's a fucking stupid idea, bro. You know, no one said that, but a lot of people were like, you know, that's pretty cool to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, cool. You want to sit down for a few minutes? I'll ask you some quick questions. And it was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, Five minutes later, somebody walked in with a blunt, and, you know, I almost had somebody to sit down, and, you know, I can't really, you know, raise the ante or raise the bar on somebody who just walked in with a blunt. I ain't got shit for you but questions. Um, but my goal with this is to create, like I said, an artful platform so which people can get out their content and things of that nature, and I can also get out mine. Um, because some people also say, you know, they're funny, but they're not good on stage. Their back and forth is what makes them funny with people, so we can sit here and go back and forth with each other. Um, what's it called here? Yeah, I have no problems, you know, giving the questions out now. 
that I plan on doing in these interviews. So it'll be like I'm interviewing myself, if you will. Um, so here we go. Interview uh, Questions that I plan on doing on these interviews are pretty much self-explanatory. You don't have to answer them if you don't want to. You can answer however way you want. You can be a smart ass. I'm probably not going to go back and forth with you like that because this is for you to get your content out. So if you want to be a dick about how you get your content out, then I don't know. It's all up to you. I'm just here. Uh, so I'm going to be like, who are you? What's your name? Where are you on Instagram? Me, Pierre Escargo. That's the name I go by on stage. I used to go by Silver Spoon Coon, but you know, that ship has sailed. Um, been doing comedy about a year and a half. Um, Instagram, yeah, Silver Spoon Coon. Silver with a U S I L V U R. Spoon Coon, as it's spelled, one word. Um, what got you into doing stand up? For a long time, I've always been like funny, you know what I'm saying? Not really the class clown, but just everybody who just like, oh my God, you're so funny. I show up places, people, oh no, I'm, I know we're about to have a good time. Silver Spoon's here. Um, but it was actually my ex-girlfriend that like pushed me into doing stand-up comedy. We were going by a comedy, Laughing Skull Lounge in downtown a couple years back. And she was like, oh my God, you should do stand-up. And I was like, yeah, I'll think about it. She was like, no, seriously, like take a picture. So I took a picture of uh, the open mic thing and uh, got Ben Evans' email. And you know, she was about to come by one day and she's like, did you send me an email? And I was like, no, nah, I don't really like this beat. Okay. It's not that I don't like it. But you know, it's kind of slowing me down. I need some turn up. What do we got here? Okay. Um, but yeah, she was like, you know, uh, she was about to come by one day and she was like, did you send Ben the email? And I was like, nah. She said, like, well, go ahead and send it or I'm not coming by. I was like, you crazy. But she dead ass was like, send him an email. I sent it to him, sent her a screenshot. She came by, got the date. And yeah, very first stand up or time doing stand up ever was at Laughing Skull Lounge, Full House. I was sweating like a hoe in church. Oh my god, I was so fucking nervous. Like the whole Eminem 8 Mile business. Like his palms are sweaty, knees weak, arms are heavy. But I went out there, you know, grabbed the mic, just started talking. And right before I went, uh, this comedian told me, you know, the best thing you can do, the worst thing you can do is try and be something you're not. He was like, if you're not political, don't talk about politics. If you're not a fighter, don't talk about beating somebody up. Talk about what you know, and things that you know are just gonna come to you. And yeah, so I was like, all right, bet. So you know, I just went out there and talked about my dick. I'm pretty sure, or you know, hanging around white people. Um, so next question: When do you usually do your stand up, and where? I usually perform uh, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. I try to Tuesdays. It's a toss up, but I'm usually trying to go to Cat's Cafe Wednesday. Uh, I'm usually at the Strand Theater, Marietta Square. Thursdays, uh, there's like Harold's Chicken and Ice Bar. I haven't been there yet, but I'm trying to get there. There's uh, Apache. There's... Uh, I forget. Some coffee shop. Another one. Then there's uh, Uptown. Uh, Thursday, Thursday. Oh, Imperial, Indicator. There too. Random part of the interview though, but I am performing at Star Bar, which is across the street from the Vortex in the Little Five Points, uh, January 25th. Show starts at 9.30, probably get there around 9, 8.45. Um, July 16th, I'm booked at Laughing Skull Lounge. Uh, that, you gotta pay to get in that one, that one's $11. That show starts at 7.30. Doors open, I believe, no, doors open at 7.30, show starts at 8, I'm sorry. Um... But yeah, that's where I usually do my stand-up. How long have you been a comedian? About a year and a half. Why are you still doing stand-up? Um, I thoroughly and truly believe that I could make a career out of doing stand-up myself. Um, I would love to do it. And it's not like, you know, I don't believe in myself. I do believe in myself that I have the capabilities to be a very great comedian. You know, I don't even want to be famous. I just want to make enough money for... I don't know, delivering content or just making people laugh if you want in any way, shape, form, or fashion, whether it be writing or performing or hosting or some type of event. I just don't want to wake up and get dressed and go somewhere 
And you know what I'm saying? Like, word, if you will. Um, my most memorable bomb. Uh, my most memorable bomb was at Uptown Comedy Corner. I was... No, it was like my third or fourth time doing stand-up. I was hung the fuck over. I was high. I wasn't getting ready to go. And then the homie Eric Kaminsky actually called me. Because I posted on Facebook. I was like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to go. And he called me. He was like, well, why aren't you going? And I was like, no, I'm not feeling too good. And he fucking conned me. He was like, uh, you, know, you know, Michael Jordan also didn't feel good in game five against Utah Jazz in 97. He scored like 68 points with the food poisoning or something. Do you have food poisoning? I was like, nah. He was like, oh, okay. Do you got to like run around and shit? I was like, nah. You just got to stand up and talk? And I was like, yeah. He was like, wow, that's crazy. You must be like dying sick. He's like, nah, not really. So I went. I get up there. Like four or five comedians went up. Ed Lover was a host, you know what I'm saying? They were semi-funny. But when I walked in with my fiance, she was my girl at the time. She's half Korean and half Italian. All the black people in there just kept staring at me like me, mother. So I was like, damn, okay. So I was feeling like shit. I went on stage, grabbed the mic, and by the time I grabbed the mic, I looked down and I didn't realize every single person in the crowd, like 80% of the crowd was like black women from the ages of like 35 to 50. And my material was nothing that they wanted to hear. Oh my God. I don't even remember what I said. I went out and did my introduction, I'm like, well, I'm Pierre's Cargo. No, I'm not French, I'm just a nigga with a French name. Silence. Like, bone chilling silence. I was like, okay, I immediately started sweating. Don't even remember what I said after that, but I remember I was like, yeah, well, I'm that nigga that came in with that white bitch. Everybody laughs. And I was like, oh, they want racist coonery. By that time, I just gave the fuck up, but I got off stage. DJ started playing crickets. Started playing the plane crashing. Then the host, Ed Lover, got up there. He was like, make some noise to my nigga Pierre S. Cargo. And everybody was like, woo. Literally, I wanted to walk out the door, but I was like, nah, I gotta sit here and get this. He said, like, come on, man. None of y'all know these as comedians. Let me see y'all get on stage and do better than that. Like, that ass, anybody could do better than that. And I was like, oh, shit. He was like, like, my nigga came all the way from France and brought y'all this garbage. This is some, this is some high class garbage. This is that French trash. And I was like, yep. Yeah. It's pretty bad. Have I ever been booed? No. Not yet. Um, ever bombed at a black comedy club? That's what I just said, yeah. Favorite comedy club and when are you there? My favorite comedy club to perform at right now is Laughing Skull Lounge. I'm really trying to fuck up Star Bar, though. And I'm at Laughing Skull Lounge, July 16th. Um, do you still get nervous before a show? Uh, it's more of like anxious. Uh, but yeah, I get a little nervous only if I don't know what I'm going to talk about. Like if I don't know the material that the crowd's going to bite on or whatever. So I usually don't like to go first. And if I go first, I mean, you just, sometimes you just got to fucking bomb. It just happens. Um, but no, I usually don't get nervous if I have a general consensus of what they're going to laugh at. But by just hearing what someone else is talking about, then I'm like, okay, I can not grab from that, but I have something similar in that same field of laughter, if you will. Um, do you have a favorite or like another local comedian or look up to one? Yeah, there's a few. I like Will Foskey. I like, uh, Jarrell Derulio Ledger, nigga Goofy. I like Sonny Gillespie, Sonny G, the legendary Sonny G. Uh, Keith Vance, Dora, Dora Monica, that's my nigga Monica, you know what I'm saying? Uh... Trying to see who else. I don't know. There's a few other people too. Yeah, Joe Breyers. I want to do a little video with him. He also has a podcast. Will Foskey has a podcast as well. It's called OAS Opinions and shit. Um, that's about it I, that I can think of right now. And have you learned something from these comedians? Yeah, Will Foskey was actually a. Uh, one of the first ones to tell me something. There was this joke I used to tell. I don't remember what it is now, but I told it, everyone laughed. I told it somewhere else, no one laughed. I told it at that same place again that no one laughed at, but I told it differently than like everyone laughed. And he was like, why did you uh, change that joke? And I was like, well, because people weren't getting it and I know it's funny, so I wanted to make it so people understood it. 
And, you know, he was like, you should never change your joke to accommodate somebody else, really. And I was like, well, why? And he was like, well, being a comedian, your comedy is your craft, and that's how you make money, essentially. That is you. So if you have a diamond and you know it's worth $10 million, but nobody can afford it, would you sell that diamond for $4 million just so people could buy it off of you and you can have something from it? And I was like, honestly, probably, but I know what you're saying. Like, you shouldn't do that. If you know how much something is worth, you should keep it at its value. That was pretty cool. So I don't change my jokes anymore. If you don't laugh, if you're too dumb to get a smart joke, then I'm just going to make fun of you for being dumb. Um, is there another or have a favorite famous comedian that you would like to work with slash see in the crowd? Uh, yeah, I would like to work with Clayton English, Carlos Miller, Darren Brand, Tyler Chronicles. Well, they, they, they ain't really local comedians. Well, they're famous, though. Uh, Dave Chappelle, clearly. Donald Rollins. Donald Glover. If I met Donald Glover, I would probably lose my collective shit. Like, I wouldn't be able to form a coherent sentence. Is there a joke you don't tell anymore or something that you think is funny that no one else does? A whole bunch of things. Um... I don't even want to say it, it's so bad. I'm not going to. <laughs> well, I will say this. No. Ricky Gervais did a joke or had a set of... It was like a dead baby bit. And I have never in my life laughed at anything related to dead baby jokes. But I did. I laughed so hard. I was almost crying. And I had to cut it off. Take a break. Take a shower. And think about if I was really going to do this. And I did. And I finished it the next day. And I kept laughing even harder. And I, I didn't hate myself. That doesn't make me a bad person. Um, what was the name of the first comedy club you went to? And how did it go? Laugh and Skull Lounge. Killed it. Uh, what kind of material did you perform when you first started doing comedy? When I first started doing comedy, it was a lot of racial humor. Like how white people perceive black people and how black people perceive white people. And interactions with people after you know how they perceive you type deal. Like, if you know a white dude is about to say something really corny to you, like, Oh my man, what's up Jamal? How the fuck are you, G-Dog? You wouldn't get upset. But if you didn't know he was about to say that shit, you wouldn't. I, I don't know, you might react a little differently. You know what I'm saying? Um... What was something you learned from doing stand-up that you wish somebody told you? That not everybody is going to laugh at everything you say. Not everything you say is funny. Like, I learned that, for example, somebody asked me, who's your favorite comedian? I was like, Dave Chappelle, you know? And he was like, do you think everything Dave Chappelle has ever said is funny? And I was like, no. And he was like, right. Nobody, you don't like everything about your favorite person. And I was like, personally, yeah, you're right. Because I love my mother to death. But I can't stand three-fourths of the things she says to me. I don't agree with it, but I still love the woman. Um, but those are the questions that I plan on asking during the interview. Um, and someone asked me, how does doing stand-up work? And who books my shows, if you will? And hold on. Sounds like it. Um Okay. how doing the shows blah 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 now there's a few things you can do uh, the, so there's show up or open mic okay open mic is essentially like karaoke you show up 
you sign up, you go up. That's how it's supposed to go, you know? So usually, let's say a show starts at nine. The, you get there, if you're a comedian, probably around 8.30. I probably get there around 8.15. I'm always early or I try to be. They'll drop a list. The list has X amount of spots. You would sign up for said spot. Uh, sometimes the hosts, they like jumble the names up or they don't do any particular order at some places. They just, if you're on the list, you're on the list. They can call you whenever or sometimes they go by the list as order. Uh, some places have a feature comedian or a resident comedian. A resident comedian is someone who is always there at the residence or has a residency there, so they can just walk in and just perform whenever they want if they're not on the list. A feature comedian is the headliner, and the headliner at a comedy club usually gets anywhere from however long they want. You can go for five or they can go for 30, whatever. I'm, some places it's 15, but you, I've seen places go for 30 as well. Um, then there's, uh, rooms, like comedy rooms. So a room is like a place that's usually not a comedy club, but certain nights of the week, there's a person who runs that room as a comedy show. Now, when you have a room, rules don't really regulate by the show up and go, it's like house rules type deal. So... That's like where who you know comes into play. Um, so rooms can go, they can drop a list, you can sign up, and they can have somebody just walk in and be like, yo, what up, I'm the homie, blah, blah, blah. And they can just go on and perform. You can get bumped off the list because somebody showed up. They don't really, rooms, they don't really make people who are resident. They have a lot more residents, I believe, or it seems like rooms don't let people who they don't know go over their time but if you're a resident there you can go they just don't really care you know what i'm saying but if you're a resident they're usually pretty funny so they just want people to be funny i get it uh if you're booked now booking i don't know i do my own booking i suppose so i usually call a lot of co uh, comedy clubs i find who i need to talk to who i need to email and find out who I need to email uh, I find out who I need to email get in touch with them send them back and forth send them a video of mine They'll email me back, be like, that's a good clip. Are you available on this day? Or we have an event on this day. We're willing to pay you this much. Does this meet your budget? Sometimes they ask if you can, if not alter, cater your material to a certain venue or type deal. Because um, it's like, we're paying you. I don't know, some people take that as... I don't know, they want to take it for granted because they know you don't really get paid for doing it. So when they offer you money, they want you to do something that you don't usually do for it. Um, you know, it's like if you sing love songs, they want you to make a pop song about like dancing in a club with your friends because they're paying you. And that's not really your steal of. Like you could do it, but you know, that's not really where your passion is or whatever. But still, you get booked. So they usually give you a date. You have to show up by a certain time. No questions asked. And you perform, you do your thing, you bring your best shit, and like you usually wanna bring some shit that's for everybody. Like personally for me, I talk about food and sex a lot, because no matter who you are, what color, where you come from, how much money you make, what you do in your so like your free time, you're gonna eat and you're gonna fuck. One more than the other, sometimes both at the same time, sometimes one of each other. Um, and then uh, I also have here performing at White Rooms. Is that what it says? Yeah, White Rooms. Um, I don't know, as a black person, like White Rooms, I'm not gonna lie, they're actually run the way they say like in emails and shit. So like if they make a flyer and they say show up, go up, or talk to this person, and you do that and they say, okay, that's what it is. And you're like, bet, it's a White Room. Now that you got in, it's your chance to either be the Silver Spoon Coon or you know, just let the full nigga out. Like, just, I don't know. I don't feel like I conform to anything when I perform at White Rooms. I just, 
talk about whatever I feel like talking about that day. And usually it's something funny. And like, I don't make fun of white people. Like, I feel like a lot of black comedians do that. Like, when they see white people in the crowd, it's like, oh, look, we got white people here. And they're just like, yeah, we're white. Like, I look at it this way. If you were in a uh, white comedy club and you walked in and the white comedian was like, oh, look, it's a black guy. You'd just be like, well, I don't know. I'd be proud. I'd be like, bitch, you can't beat my ass. I don't know. I just wouldn't. Re I don't know. That's different. Uh, black rooms, they're, man, they got some funny people or they got some really shitty people there. It's like either or. There usually is no in between. You know, you're either funny or you're not. Black people, I feel like, are quicker to boo you, though. Like, you can walk out on stage before you can grab the microphone and niggas will already just start roasting you. Like, so I feel like they quick to judge you on whether or not you're funny or not based on how you look. Fuck if the content of what you're talking about. If you just look funny, like look weird, them niggas are just going to assume you're whack off for it, no matter what you say. They just have a preconceived thought that you're just trash already. Like, look at this nigga. Ugh, lad, boy. Can't be funny. Uh, and that just goes with a lot of the politics and the stand-up. But those are the questions I was going to talk about. Um, don't really know how much time is on this thing. But a friend of mine on Facebook asked if I can talk about her being a parent. Well, not asked if I can talk about it. It was just like read me, me reading parent vlogs and, or blogs and stuff like that and me responding to it. And then it just hit me. Like, I am, I'm not now, but there was a time where I was terribly afraid of using, well, not, no, I was terribly afraid of not using condoms. The idea of it frightened me to my core because I would have a baby. I know I have bad luck. So I feel like if I was to hit it raw, God would just be like, boom, blessing. And I ain't ready for all that right now. Well, I am now more likely, but back then, no, 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 I wouldn't do it. I forgot where I was going with that. Yep, yeah, it's gone. No, hold on. I'm gonna get it back. Nope, it's gone. Marijuana affects the memory. I was saying something about trying to have a baby, not having sex for all. Somebody said you ain't ready. Oh, yeah, being a parent. Boom, got it. Um, I don't know shit about being a parent. I just know my mom talked to me like I was an adult for most of my childhood. Like all throughout my childhood, even to now, because she was like, you understand what I'm saying and you respond accordingly, so I'm just gonna talk to you motherfucking ass any way I want. I didn't know nigga was a bad word either until I was like in fifth or sixth grade. Cause I thought bad words were words you couldn't say at home or in front of your parents. I said nigga all the time at home. Everybody said nigga. So I didn't think it was wrong. I remember I was in school and my teacher was like, Pierre, what are you doing? Cause I had slapped somebody or some shit. I said, this nigga took my pencil. And she was like, you can't say that. And I was like, this nigga took my writing utensil. I don't know what you want me to say. And then, you know, she was like, do you say that at home? And I was like, yeah, all the time, nigga. And then they called my mom and like tried to, my mom got pissed off because the people at school tried to make it seem like she was being a bad mom because she let her kids say nigga in front of her. She was like, I'll beat your ass. I was like, see, y'all niggas fucked up. But uh, I don't know much about being a parent though. I just seems like you just taking care of another pet, except it's yours that you made. It's always puking and peeing and pooping. I can't deal with shit. Like poop, can't fuck with it at all. I think I'm gonna end. Oh no, no, something else too. They were talking about the Kendrick Lamar thing, like how he tricked that white girl into saying nigga on stage. That was not a trick. Like you can't be tricked into saying something you're comfortable with saying already. Like, I always use this example, the video I saw years ago, that word is relative to your relationship. So like, if you have a dad, you don't call your dad, if your dad's name's Bill, you don't call your dad Bill. You don't be like, hey Bill, because that's not how your relationship is. That is your dad, you call Bill dad. Your mom might call him Bill. Your mom might call him honey. Bill or honey, do you call your dad honey? No. Because that's not how your relationship is. Your dad's friends, they might call him Will. They might call him Willie. Willie Will, Billy Will, Willie Bill Will. You don't call your dad Willie. Your mom don't call him Willie. Because that's not how either of your relationships are. So I think with the word nigger, she said it 
with a microphone because she says it all the time at home. Like if I don't say, it's like a kid. You know you're not supposed to curse, but you do anyway. And your parents ask you, do you curse? And you're like, no, you just don't curse around adults. You curse around adults when you curse around your parents and they think it's okay. Then you curse around other adults. I pretty much still don't curse around people's adults. Like if, I don't know, like even if it's my parents now, I don't curse in front of them. Um, but she, that chick that said, nigga, she said it like four times. She didn't even realize she said it until Kendrick Lamar walked up and grabbed the microphone from her. And she was like, what, well, am I not cool enough? And he was like, no, you just can't say that word. And she was like, what word? And he was like, nigga. She was like, <gasps> And you know, she says, she probably says that shit at home all the time and she has black friends who have probably never told her she can say nigga, but she said it and they've never said anything to her about it from then. So she took that as she can do it. It's like if you steal from a store and they see you stealing and they don't call the police, you're gonna steal from there again. So she just forgot her place. And like somebody else is telling me, that's like if you're, you got a white homie in your group of friends and there's like 80 of y'all and all 80 of y'all say, yo, you can say nigga, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like around us, you know what I'm saying? We don't, we don't even care. And he's like, oh, for real? I can say nigga. You know what I'm saying? And then he says it. I think it's weird that you want to say it. So it's like if my fiance was like, you can call me a whore if you want to. I would just, if I was just to be like, whore, that means I was like waiting to say it. I don't want to call you a whore. Like, and if you think I do, that's strange. I don't have that desire in me. And it's like, I know Hispanic people call each other like pendejo, like, you know, cabron, like cerote. I know the words. I don't have that desire in me to call them that at all, not even a little bit. So I think if you have that desire in you and it hurts you not to say it because everyone else says it, it's a weird thing. So I don't feel bad for her. I think she says it all the time. And she thought that it was okay. So it's like that, like I said, the black people that have that white dude that say that white dude went to the store, saw two other black dudes and he didn't know. He was like, what's up, nigga? And they beat his ass. And he was like, yo, they said I can say it, though. It's like you only got a stamp from eight people with your black card. If you want to say nigga, you got to get it stamped by every single nigga individually. It's a big card and not everyone's going to stamp it. So that's how I feel on that. That's been the show today with Pierre Escargo.